Would you open your Bibles to Romans chapter 11? I always enjoy the privilege of going through a passage of Scripture verse by verse, but uh, so much of the time I find myself teaching by a subject such as the subject of trusting God, and in order to do that, we need to sort of comb through the Scriptures, and so as you have detected from the first two nights if you've been here, my habit is to start with a passage of Scripture and look at that passage of Scripture and then bring to bear other passages of Scripture that would help us to understand and to see the light of that particular passage. And that, again, is what we will be doing this morning. So I want to, um, by the way, in the in the worship service, I am going to take a passage of Scripture and work through that. But uh, this morning we're going to consider various passages. And so I want us to look at Romans chapter 11, verses 33 and 34. Romans 11, verses 33 and 34. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Paul continues, or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? But I want us to look particularly at verses 33 and 34 and the, the statement in verse 33, how unsearchable or his judgments, and how inscrutable his ways, for who has known the mind of the Lord? In the previous two nights, we've looked at the sovereignty of God as Jesus illustrated it for us in the destiny of a sparrow by saying to us that a single sparrow could not fall to the ground apart from the will of our Heavenly Father. And then last night, we saw that God does not forget a single sparrow, and in both of those occasions, Jesus made a very clear application that we are of more value than many sparrows. And the truth is, if God controls the destiny of a sparrow and does not forget the sparrow, how much more true is it that he controls every event of our lives and never forgets us? And so we can trust him because he is both powerful and good. But the question always arises, if this is true, if God is all-powerful, that is, in control of every event in our lives, and if God is good and works out all things in our lives for our good, then why do we experience so much difficulty and even pain in our lives? Now, the answer to that is we consider the big pictures, we consider history, is it all of the pain and the heartache and the frustration and difficulties of life are the result of the fall, the result of Adam's sin. Because God not only, as a result of Adam's sin, brought a curse upon the entire creation, and the reason that we have hurricanes and droughts, floods and uh, boll weevils and these kinds of things is because of the curse that God put upon creation. And we see that in Romans chapter 8 that the Apostle Paul says that even creation itself longs to be delivered from this curse that God placed upon it. And we have the promise of the new heavens and the new earth when that curse will be removed and God will have made all things new. And then, of course, because of the fall, because each of us have inherited the flesh, the sinful predisposition from Adam, Uh, there are the sinful actions of all of us and we through our sinful actions hurt one another, cause one another pain, disappoint one another and all kinds of things and so we can say that all of the evil in the world all of the difficulty and pain in the world is ultimately traced back to the fall, to Adam's sin. On an individual level, however, and particularly as we look at specific instances of difficulties and pain in our lives, as we look at the individual heartaches and disappointments 
And if we seek to ask the question why, what is God's purpose in this particular heartache, usually we come up with no answer. Once in a while, God lets us see, and more importantly, I should say, after the fact, he would let us see that he has a purpose in a particular pain or heartache that he brings into our lives, and we can say, yes, because of that, such and such has happened. But at least during the course of the event, and, and oftentimes, even after the fact, we ask ourselves, why did God bring this, or why did God allow this person's sinful actions to hurt me like they did, and we have, simply have to say, we do not know. And that's why this passage here in Luke, um, sorry, Luke, uh, in, in Romans uh, 11 helps us because Paul speaks of the unsearchableness of his judgments <clears throat> and says, and how inscrutable are his ways. In other words, his, excuse me, <clears throat> he says that his ways are past tracing out. We simply cannot fathom the ways of God. God knows what he is doing, but he hasn't told us what he's doing, and his ways are mysterious, they're inscrutable, and uh, they're past finding out. But one thing that we can be confident of, that God does nothing without a purpose. Now, you might see a little boy walking along, and uh, he, he comes along, and he sees a mud puddle there, and he picks up a rock, and he throws it into the mud puddle, and you ask him, why did he do that? And he just shrugs his shoulder. He, he, he's just, you know, he's just being a little boy. But God does absolutely nothing without a purpose. And so the corollary of that, if God does nothing without a purpose, the corollary is this. For the child of God, there is no pain without a purpose. Every pain that God brings or allows to come into our lives has a purpose behind it, and God is the one who has determined that purpose, and God is the one who brings that circumstance or that event into our lives because he has a purpose behind it, though you and I may never in this life know what that particular purpose is. But it should be sufficient for us that though we may never know the purpose, that God himself knows the purpose. In fact, one of the, one of the aspects of the pain or the disappointment or heartache or the frustration oftentimes is the fact that we simply do not know why these things occur. They seem to happen, from our, our perspective, they seem to happen uh, at random and without any purpose. And uh, so we, that, that's part of the pain. Because we think, well, if I just knew what God was doing, uh, then it would help. Then, it, then we could understand. But so oftentimes, God's purpose is so far beyond us. And in Romans 11 here, Paul not only says that God's ways are unsearchable, but he also says, who has known the mind of the Lord, and then more importantly, who has been his counselor? Or to use our modern uh, business term, who has been God's consultant? Who did God ever hire as his consultant in either the creation or the management of his universe? If you look up the word wisdom uh, in your concordance, either your paper concordance or your computer concordance, and you just look up the word wisdom or understanding uh, as it pertains to God, you will find that almost exclusively it pertains to God's wisdom in creation. And as we consider creation, as we just look around at the things which we can see even with our unaided eye, we see the marvels of God's creation. In fact, Paul tells us in Romans chapter 1 that mankind is without excuse because just in looking around us with the unaided eye, we should be able to see the glory and the wisdom of God just in what he has created. But as science has come along and as science has kind of thought God's thoughts after him and has explained to us some of the scientific laws and so forth, uh, 
that are involved in creation, then we have reason more and more to marvel at the infinite wisdom of God. For example, I read several years ago that uh, the scientists who believe in the Big Bang theory, you know, that something just happened, and, and let me say, I don't believe in the Big Bang theory, but it's possible, it's very possible, that when God said, let there be, that there was a Big Bang. You know, that just all of a sudden it happened. And uh, so, but they tell us, and, and of course they're working backward, and, and uh, you think, how in the world did they ever come up with these kinds of, of statements? But they said at the instant of the Big Bang, that the ratio of mass plus energy over volume had to be so precise that it's point zero zero, you know, just a whole string of zeros across this room. Basically, they were saying it had to be absolutely exact. Now, during my short stint in the aircraft industry back in the early 1950s, I had the interesting experience of being involved in the transition from propeller-driven airplanes, which flew at about 180 miles an hour, to supersonic jet fighter planes which exceed the speed of sound over 600 miles an hour. And uh, I was involved in setting up standards for quality control and these kinds of things. And, and I want to tell you that the, the difference in the tolerances that are required to build an airplane that flies 180 miles an hour uh, versus an airplane that flies in excess of 600 miles an hour the differences are extreme. In fact, one of the difficulties that we had was trying to educate the the workforce, the foreman, and this, of course, was in the early uh, 1950s, and uh, most of these people had built bombers for World War II, and uh, they weren't going to let any whippersnapper young engineer just out of school tell them how to build airplanes. And uh, one of the big problems that we had was trying to convince these foremen down on the assembly line that building a supersonic jet was not like building a B-24 that they'd been building for so many years. But tolerances. In fact, there's a joke among engineers that if you ask an engineer what is 2 plus 2, he won't just say it's 4. He'll say it's 4 plus or minus point zero 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 because an engineer knows that you can never get anything absolutely precise. But God does. When these scientists tell us that uh, the, you know that the mass plus energy over volume ratio had to be accurate within certain certain thing, God, as it were, smiles. He says, "You've got to be kidding. It's exact. It's exactly the way I intended it to be." And we marvel at creation. The microbiologists now who have these electronic microscopes and they can, they can uh, look at a cell which prior to the advent of the, micro, uh, the electronic uh, microscopes were just a kind of a little blob. But now they can see that and, and through that uh, they can see really what's happening to that little cell of which there are about 75 to 100 trillion cells in your body. Now, as you and I, as you sit there, and as I stand here before you this morning, this is what's happening in one of those cells. If, uh, and I'm reading here from a scientist, a microbiologist, and he says, um, if, if you would take one of these cells and would blow it up to where it's the size of a giant spaceship, about 12 miles in diameter, he says, this is what you would see. We would see an object of unparalleled complexity and adaptive design. On the surface of a cell, we would see millions of openings. Now stop and consider that for a moment. This little tiny cell, which they can only see through a microscope, and which you have between 75 and 100 trillion of them in your body, each one of those cells itself has millions of openings. And he says these, these openings would be opening and closing to allow a continual stream of materials to flow in and out. And if we were to enter one of these openings, we would find ourselves in a world of supreme technology and bewildering complexity. 
And he says, in fact, he says, if you could go into the most automated factory in the world today, what you would see would be the same thing that you would see in a cell. Now, obviously not hardware, not steel and wire and these kinds of things, but you would see the very same functions that are carried out by a completely automated factory of robotic machines and digital controls and all of these things. He says you would see these in existence in a cell, in your body. He said we would see nearly every feature of our own advanced machines, uh, artificial languages and their decoding systems, memory banks for information storage and retrieval, elegant control systems regulating the automated assembly of parts and components, error fail-safe and proofreading devices utilized for quality control, assembly processes involving the principles of prefabrication and modular construction. In fact, so deep would be the feeling of deja vu. In other words, we've seen that before. So, persuade, so persuasive the analogy that much of the terminology that we would use to describe this fascinating molecular uh, reality would be borrowed from the world of today's technology. But then he goes on to say, what we would be witnessing would be an object resembling an immense automated factory, a factory larger than a city and carrying out almost as many unique functions as all of the manufacturing activities of man on earth. However, it would be a factory which would have one capacity not equal to in any of our most advanced machines, for it would be capable of replicating its entire structure within a matter of a few hours. In other words, here is this automated factory, and uh, it simply replicates itself in a matter of a few hours. And we read something like that, and we consider, you know, the, the tolerances of mass over energy, uh, mass plus energy over volume, and, and we read figures like that, and we, we marvel and we say, isn't God smart? Well, obviously he is. I mean, everything that science can come up with, and, and, you know, if God leaves us here for the next hundred years, everything that science will be able to come up with are simply thinking God's thoughts after him. When science discovers something, they're simply discovering something that God built into the universe when he created it. We don't discover something new. We discover something that's been there since God created it. And so we look at that and we marvel at God's wisdom and creation. But we often question God's wisdom and providence. Now, I've used the word providence. And probably most of you have an idea of what I'm getting at. But for the sake of you, that that might be a new term... Uh, and I could give a theological definition of the word providence, but just let me say this. Providence, just the easy way to think of it is providence is God's active orchestrating of all the events in his universe for his glory and our good. And, and the key words, actively orchestrating. Now let me make a contrast just to help us understand. Last night... The NCAA tournament, basketball tournament, had a couple of semifinal games. And the coaches of those teams, those four teams that were involved, when it comes right down to it, when the tip-off comes, the coach becomes a spectator. He has drilled, he has trained, he has coached, he has, to the best of his ability, he has prepared those players for that game. And then periodically he can call them out for a timeout and he can instruct them and correct them and these kinds of things. But at best, he is, when the game is going on, when the, when the young men are out there on the floor, he is a spectator. He is not in control. God is not a spectator in his universe. God didn't just coach us and then say, okay, get out on the floor and play the game. God actively orchestrates every event that occurs in his universe every second. At this precise moment, even as I speak, God is orchestrating literally billions of events that are occurring. Trees that are leafing out, bugs that are coming out of their holes, 
cars that are driving down the freeways, airplanes that are flying, people that are in churches, preachers and Bible teachers speaking, everything, the war going on in Iraq. God is actively orchestrating every event in his universe. God is not a spectator. God is in control. God is orchestrating those. And that's what we can call God's providence. God's actively orchestrating every event in his universe to accomplish his purposes, to glorify himself and for our good. And the reason that we question the providence of God is because we do not see what he is doing. We can look at creation as an established fact and we can say, isn't God smart? Isn't, isn't God... We, we marvel at the wisdom of God and we read something that this microbiologist has written for us about the, the intricacies and the marvels of the human cell that's in our bodies. And we, we marvel at God's creative ability that he can do such a thing in something that's so tiny that has, you have to have an electronic microscope to even look at it. We marvel at that because we can see and we can understand what is happening. But when we look at providence, most of the time we simply do not understand what's going on. And of course, in the day in which we live, things are going from bad to worse. And so we think, you know, if God were in control, surely he wouldn't allow things to get so out of control as they appear today. But the Apostle Paul says to us, how unsearchable are his judgments and how unscrutable his ways. Let me give you a couple of examples. If you'll turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 24. <clears throat> Luke chapter 24, and this is the first Easter Sunday, <clears throat> and um, we'll pick up with verse 13, the two disciples that are on the road to Emmaus. So Luke 24, beginning with verse 13. That very day, that first Easter Sunday, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What is this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who is a prophet mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. And now their hopes have been dashed because this one that they hoped would redeem Israel had been crucified on a Roman cross and was dead. And now, of course, they hear, as you continue on, it's the third day since these things happened and so forth. But what I want you to see is this. They had hoped that Jesus would be the one to redeem Israel, and that is exactly what happened, but not in the way that they had anticipated. And so they were sad. They thought that all of this was a failure because God did not work the way that they anticipated that he would work. And so we smile at that and after the fact. And I can say to you today, I can stand up and say, they thought it was going to happen and then they were disappointed because they were expecting it to happen a certain way. But God accomplished his purpose. That's exactly what he did. He redeemed Israel. But not in the way that they expected. And so they were perplexed. 
his ways were unscrutable to them. And we, we like this story because it provides a good illustration for us. You know, we think how God is going to do something and then he either doesn't do that or he does it a completely different way. And, and, but it, but it all comes out in the end. It, you know, it's one of these happily ever after kind of stories. And, and we like this kind of story, do we not? But now turn with me to Acts 24. This was Luke 24. Turn with me to Acts 24. <clears throat> In the context of the Acts 24 is that this is just after Paul has been set upon by the Jews in the temple in Jerusalem and was rescued by the Roman centurion and then was sent off to Caesarea. And um, so he's, he's there and, you know, the Jews come down and uh, try to condemn him and so forth. And at the, at the end of chapter 24... Verse 27, when two years had elapsed, that is, two years since Paul was taken upon in Jerusalem, two years since he had been sent down to Caesarea, two years have now gone by. When two years had elapsed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus, and desiring to do the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul in prison. Two whole years and nothing to show for it. Now, later on, Paul is in prison, or at least in house arrest in Rome, and he writes Philippians and Colossians and Philemon and Ephesians and, and all of these wonderful things that were happening in Rome. But we do not read of anything that occurred during these two years. There were no converts. There were no letters written. Paul languished in prison for two whole years for no apparent reason. Held there unjustly because Felix wanted to do the Jews a favor. And he was also hoping that perhaps he might get a bribe, a payoff from Paul. Now, in order to help us understand what this is like, I don't know how many of you are into into sports, professional sports, and so forth. But um, uh, there's a man by the name of Peyton Manning who comes from someplace down in this area. Does he not? Okay, I can hear. Okay, you know Peyton Manning. And, of course, Peyton Manning was the most valuable player at the Super Bowl a few weeks ago. Now, suppose that at the beginning of this season, the coach would simply put Peyton Manning on the bench for the next two years and bring in a substitute and the Indianapolis Colts would fall apart as a result what would people think? they'd think that coach had absolutely lost his mind I mean to, to take the most valuable player in the Super Bowl and to bench him for two whole seasons the sports writers would have a field day. They would be chewing him up, and the coach, they'd be chewing him up and spitting him out. The stupid imbecile of a coach that would do such a thing as to sideline this, this extraordinary superhero football player. It is just sidelining. This is what God did. You might say, God of Paul was the most valuable player on the apostolic team. He was a brilliant theologian. You read the book of Romans and you see that. He was an evangelist. Now, let me tell you, with all due respect to both theologians and evangelists, it's difficult to get those two gifts in the same body. I mean, just by the nature of the thing. But Paul was a theologian. He was an evangelist. He was a church planter. He was even a cross-cultural missionary. All of these things wrapped into one. And God sidelines him. God puts him on the bench, so to speak, for two whole years. 
And he doesn't even call a press conference to tell us why he did it. He just, God dismisses, God writing, God who inspired uh, Luke to write these words, God dismisses those two whole years in one sentence. When two years had elapsed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus in desiring to do the Jews a favor. Felix left Paul in prison. That's all it says. And you say, why God? Why did you do this? Why did you, from our perspective, waste two whole years of Paul's life? And God says, my ways are inscrutable. My ways are beyond tracing out. My ways, to use the words of Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now this today, when we send space probes out to the other planets and men walking on the moon, uh, a phrase such as higher than the heavens is not as stark to us today, but in, but in those days, before the days even of airplanes, let alone spaceships, to say that something was higher than the heavens, that would be an idiom for an infinite distance. And God is saying that my ways and my thoughts and my ways of doing things are an infinitely distant higher than, you, than your ways. Don't try to figure me out, God is saying to us. So instead of questioning God's ways with us, instead of questioning His providence, we need to learn to trust Him and to accept what He is doing. John Newton, whose name I'm sure you recognize as the writer of Amazing Grace and a number of other hymns, obviously, he once wrote these words, and I'm basically, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, he says that one of the marks of Christian maturity is an acquiescence, that is, a, a cheerful submission to the Lord's will founded in the persuasion of His wisdom, holiness, sovereignty, and goodness. Notice the attributes that Newton reminds us of. His wisdom, what we're looking at this morning, His holiness, His, his moral perfection, his sovereignty and his goodness, which we've looked at the last two nights. And then he says, and he says, the mark of a Christian maturity is an acquiescence in the Lord's will founded in the persuasion of his wisdom, holiness, sovereignty, and goodness. How highly does it become us, both as creatures and as sinners, to submit to the appointments of our Maker? And I would add myself, not only our Maker, but our Heavenly Father the one who sent his son to die in our place, to redeem us from the curse of his broken law. I wrote the book, Trusting God Even When Life Hurts. It was published in 1988. And in that book, I, I dwell on these three attributes of God, his sovereignty, his wisdom, and his love or his goodness. And I bring to, to bear these uh, attributes of God, and I say, because God is infinite in these three attributes, infinite in His wisdom and His wisdom and His, His goodness, that we can trust Him. And now I've asked myself, why then, when I wrote a book on it, why do I teach on it, and why do I believe everything that I'm saying to you the last two nights and this morning, why do I believe it, then why do I have difficulty trusting God? And I've come to the conclusion that the answer is this. It's not a matter of believing that God is in control and that God is good. It's a matter of accepting His will as good and acceptable and perfect. Or to put it this way, it's a matter of accepting God, what I might call God's agenda, God's plan, God's purpose, but I'm using the word agenda, you know, what God is doing. Accepting God's agenda as being better than my agenda. 
because so oftentimes God's sovereign agenda is at cross purposes with my agenda. And I want my agenda to prevail. And when God's agenda is at cross purposes with mine, then I get frustrated or upset or anxious. These kinds of things. It's, so it's, it's more than a matter of believing these truths. It's a matter of accepting. Now, there are three responses that we can have toward God when His agenda is at cross purposes with ours. We can resign ourselves to that. We can say, well, God is sovereign. God is the big guy. I'm the little guy. God is, you know, in control. I can't do anything about it. I will resign myself to my fate in this particular situation. Another way we can respond to it, which is probably a little bit better, is to say, yes, Lord, I don't like this. This is painful. This is frustrating. This is anxiety producing. But I will submit to your agenda. As I say, that's probably a little, a step higher than resigning ourselves to that. You know, you resign yourself to it because you can't do anything about it, see. So then you say, okay, God, you're in control. I will submit to your agenda. The third way that we can respond is to accept his agenda. And there's a difference between submitting to it and accepting it. When we accept it, we say, Lord, I don't understand, but I know that this is your will. I know that you are sovereign and wise and good. And I know that your plan is better than my plan, even though I don't understand how it could be. I don't understand when I've purpose to do this and I thought I was doing your will and so forth and then you frustrate it you cause it not to come to pass I don't understand how that could be but by faith I accept that your agenda is better than my agenda now better is a relative word what we should say is Lord I thought my agenda was pretty good but your agenda is perfect That's the way we learn to trust God. And as I have looked at my own life over the years and asked myself, why when I know these things do I continue to struggle, I've come to the conclusion that that's the nub of the problem there, is the reluctance to accept God's agenda, God's purpose, God's plan as superior and infinitely better than my purpose and my plan. Well, what is God's purpose? Well, again, in an individual situation, in an individual event, we simply, for the most part, do not know what God is doing or why He is doing it in our lives. But over the long haul, we know that all of these things are brought together for our good. And let's go back to Romans 8, 28 and 29, where Paul, Paul says that God, and I, I believe the the, the best translation of that, God causes all things. God causes all events because events in, in themselves do not have a will, do not, are not able to act. But God causes all these events, all these circumstances, all of these things that we find so difficult and frustrating and even painful. God causes them all to work together for our good, to those that love Him. And then he says, For whom He did foreknow, He did predestine to be conformed to the likeness of His Son. That's God's long-range purpose. How each individual circumstance fits into that purpose, we may never know. But ultimately, all of these circumstances taken together, God is bringing them together, causing them to work together for our good, that we might be conformed to the likeness of His Son. Now because of this, we can learn to give thanks in all circumstances. 1 Thessalonians 5.18, the Apostle Paul says, that 
in all circumstances give thanks, for this is the will of God concerning you. Now the will of God referred to there is the moral will of God. In fact, if you will just turn in your Bibles very quickly to 1 Thessalonians, and let's look at this passage. First Thessalonians five eighteen. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Now turn uh, to chapter four in verse three. In this context, Paul is talking about sexual purity. And he says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. The will of God there, obviously, is the moral will of God. The will of God's law. And it's the same will of God in, verse, in chapter 5, verse 18. It is the moral will of God that we give thanks in all circumstances. It is the moral will of God that we abstain from fornication, from immorality, and it is the moral will of God that we give thanks in all circumstances. What I want you to see, dear friends, is that this giving thanks is not an option. It's not just an add-on. It's not just the frosting on the cake. It is the moral will of God to give thanks in all circumstances, both what we would perceive to be good circumstances and what we would perceive to be bad circumstances. Paul says to give thanks. Now, how do we do it? We do it by faith. To, get, to just look at the circumstance in and of itself, apart from faith in the sovereignty and goodness and wisdom of God, about all you can do is just say, well, God, you said to give thanks, and you kind of clench your fist and grit your teeth and say, I'm going to give thanks, though I don't want to. Well, that, that's really not giving thanks. You give thanks from your heart. And the only way that you can give thanks from your heart when uh, circumstances are going adversely to what you would desire is by faith you believe that God is using these circumstances to make you more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let me give you what I would call a minority report. You know what a minority report is? You have a committee, you know, and, and uh, there's a five to three vote, and the, the five, that's the majority report, and the three, that's the minority report. Uh, I may be in the, re in the minority in what I'm about to say, but let me say this. It has helped me. Paul does not say give thanks for the circumstance, but give thanks in the circumstance. When my first wife died in 1988, God was not asking me to give thanks that my wife died, but to give thanks that even in that painful circumstance, that God was working to conform me to more and more into the likeness of Jesus Christ. We give thanks by faith. Lord, the circumstance is difficult, it's frustrating, it's painful, but I believe that you are using this in a way that I may never understand, but I believe that you are using this to conform me more to the likeness of Jesus Christ. I may, a few years down the road, be able to look back and say, oh yes, I can see what God did, or I can see at least something of what God did in that situation, or it may that we will never know. But by faith, we say, Lord, I believe that you're taking this circumstance and you're using it to conform me more and more to the likeness of Christ. And for that, I give you thanks. That's the moral will of God. That by faith, we thank him that he is using these circumstances to conform us to the likeness of his Son. God's sovereignty... God's goodness and God's wisdom.
I like to think of these three attributes of God as the legs of a three-legged stool. Now, I know that most stools have four legs, but we have one at home that's a three-legged stool that someone gave us after I preached a series like this. The stool is the stool of trusting God. The legs are the belief in God's sovereignty, His goodness, and His wisdom. If you look at the stool, you can readily see that if any one of those three legs is either shorter or longer than the other two, the stool is not going to be stable. Or even if one of the legs is missing, obviously there's no stool. You have to have all three of them. And you have to hold them in, in equal importance. I was disappointed. <clears throat> Um, after the book Trusting God came out and where I had dealt with the sovereignty of God and His wisdom and His love, I was disappointed because uh, people would say to me, that's a great book on the sovereignty of God. Well, that's a one-legged stool. Now, granted <coughs> that I... <coughs> excuse me. Granted that I'd spent more time developing the doctrine of the sovereignty of God than the other two, but I wanted people to see that you need all three. The sparrow cannot fall to the ground apart from God's will. That's his sovereignty. But it's just as important that we see that God does not forget a single sparrow. That's his goodness. And then it's important to see that God is infinite in his wisdom and his ways are beyond tracing out for you and me. And when we have those three, <clears throat> when, we, when we hold them together in proper proportion, then we can trust God. God is absolutely trustworthy. That's not the problem. We ask the question, can you trust God? And if we look at God, the answer is obviously yes. But when we look at ourselves and when we ask, can you trust God? Can I trust God? Do I believe what I've been saying to you in these three messages? Am I willing to accept God's agenda as infinitely perfect and far superior to my own finite agenda? When we believe these, then we can at least grow in our trust of God, realizing that we will never, ever perfectly trust God. Just as we will never, ever perfectly obey God, so we will never, ever perfectly trust God. But the good news is, there's one that perfectly trusted Him. One of the things that God uses to help me grow in trusting Him is airline travel. You know, the making of my connections. And then the other one is, you know, whether or not our luggage is going to arrive on the same flight that we do. And I, uh, most people, I think, when they go to the baggage claim area, they assume their bag will be there. I do not. <laughs> I go there every time praying because there have been so many times when it hasn't been there. And I think that God has, has uses, I think these, all of our lives are certain things that God uses to cause us to grow and, and one of these is airline travel the, you know am I going to make my connection is the bag going to be there and several years ago I had two back to back trips uh, where the bag did not make it and in both of these it was, it was rather critical uh, the first trip I had uh, taught a seminary course and I had the papers already graded and in a very unwise decision, I put those papers in my check bag. There was a reason why I did that. But even so, it was a very unwise decision. And the bag didn't come through. Eventually it did, of course. The next one was um, Jane and I went to South Africa. And uh, we arrived in Johannesburg. And we had three bags between us. Each of us had an individual bag. And then one we shared with our toilet articles and things like that. And that third bag that we shared did not get off the plane in Johannesburg. It went on to Cape Town. 
But, of course, we didn't know they went to Cape Town. For all I knew, that bag might have been languishing in some dark corner in the Atlanta airport. And uh, in, in Atlanta, you check in, and they put the tags on your bags, and then they don't put it on the conveyor belt, but they give the bags back to you, and then you have to walk down to a chute, and you yourself, the traveler, put those bags down that chute to go down to the abyss, you know, where they are x-rayed and sorted and so forth. And so, um, you know, I'm thinking, did I actually put all three of those bags down that chute? Or did I leave one, you know, standing there because I got distracted? You know, all kinds of thoughts can go through your mind. And that night, I said to Jane, you know, I have to confess, I'm just an anxious person. The next morning, I was reading my Bible in my time with God, and I happened to be reading, just happened to be, you know, in the providence of God, happened to be reading in Matthew chapter 8. And uh, in, in that chapter is the story of Jesus calming the storm on the Sea of Galilee. And the passage says that the waves were swamping the boat, and the disciples were terrified, and then it says, and Jesus was asleep. Now, look at that situation. Here are waves that are coming over this little fishing boat. And these fishermen, who are veterans on the Sea of Galilee, they are terrified. And Jesus is lying in the stern of the boat, fast asleep. And I ask myself, why was he asleep and not the disciples? Well, you could say, well, he was exhausted from a full day the day before, but the disciples were involved in the day before. They were tired also. And the obvious answer why Jesus was asleep is because he fully trusted the Father. And then this thought came to me. And this is where the Gospel comes in. Jesus was asleep in the boat for me. I'm an anxious person. Jesus fully, perfectly trusted the Father, and I get the credit for it. Because everything that Jesus did in his life and his death, he did as our substitute and representative. Not only did he die in our place, which is what we normally think of, but he also lived in our place. And Jesus was asleep in the boat for every one of us. Jesus fully trusted the Father. And when you accept Jesus as your Savior, that full trust of the Father is imputed to you. You are credited with His perfect trust, His perfect righteousness. Jesus was asleep in the boat for me. I didn't hear any voices or anything like that, but it's as if these thoughts came to my mind. It's as if the Holy Spirit said, I know you have a problem with anxiety. And we're going to work on that. I'm not going to just leave you being an anxious person. We're going to work on that. But meanwhile, I want you to know that I'm for you. Whenever you have difficulty trusting God, just remember, Jesus fully trusted the Father, and He did it in your place. Let's pray. Our Father, we were overwhelmed with your wisdom this morning as we think about this tiny cell. In fact, it's so, so, so tiny. More than we can imagine. And what a, an amazing piece of modern machinery that it really is. And you brought it into existence out of your infinite mind. And then, Father, we think of your goodness, that you never forget a sparrow and you never forget us. And then, Father, we think of the Lord Jesus and his sinless life and his sin-bearing death. All of this, Father, for us. And we have the privilege of coming to you who spoke the universe into existence by the power of your word.
and who then sent your Son to redeem us from the curse of the broken law. And then you sent your Spirit to activate your choice of us, to give us life, to call us to be your own, to give us the faith to trust Jesus as our Savior. Father, all that you have done for us, we thank you for this. And Lord, we know that there will be times when it will seem as if we are like the Apostle Paul, languishing in the prison in Caesarea. And we pray that in those times that you, by the power of your Spirit, will enable us to trust you, and by trusting you, so glorify you. And so, Father, we commit to you these words today, that through them you would help us to grow in trusting you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.